to elaborate and say why does good design matter? Because I think design in general is kind of overly ambiguous and uh, I think the design has to be good in order to communicate a message properly. So, um, one of the things that makes design good is when it challenges the status quo. So not just doing everything that's normal, you want to do something that's different that has been done before, and possibly a better way to make people's lives just a little bit better, uh, usually to sell a product and uh, communicate a message of the company that you're designing for. So one of the purposes of my talk today is to hopefully educate you and inspire you to invest in design and um, also, just if you're a designer, just to give you a little refresher on why you became one. <laughs> I need to be reminded some days, so <laughs> it's important. Um, so this is me, Andrea. Um, I love puns, <laughs> so I'll try to limit them today, but um, a little bit lately in my industry, I've been using them quite frequently to the point of annoying my coworkers. But. I think they're fun. It's, it's good to have a little bit of fun when you're designing and working with your fellow designers. Um, I've been a designer for the better part of a decade. I've worked the whole gamut. I've worked in print shops. I've worked in um, advertising for a couple of large agencies in Omaha. Um, I've been a freelancer for over a year before um, and worked in in-house and design firms. So kind of all across the board, but now I'm settling back into in-house. So uh, there's a little bit more creativity there, I feel, a little bit more freedom. Um, so I'd like to just define design. So I thought this was really cool. It's simply just a method of problem solving um, in an aesthetic and graphic way, usually. Uh, design can encompass a lot of things, but I'm going to mostly just touch on graphic design, which is what I do for a living. Mostly, um, I, I rebrand. Um, I work on elevating brands. and. I work in print, in web design, and just like logo development. So this is a little bit of part of my background. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is mostly just related to my personal experiences and what um, I was taught. So, um, so um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my company, not selling you anything, but just touch on some of the things that I've done there. Um, a couple of thought leaders that I think are really important to follow. This is Dieter Rams. Uh, I'm going to talk about my design process. It can be kind of messy at times, but I think it usually gets the job done. <laughs> um, and a couple of projects. This is a summer internship and some uh, skylines that I do that are kind of cool. And also what happens when design goes bad. <laughs> so we'll get back to talk about. <laughs> Don't want to leave that up for too long. Though. <laughs> Um, and then leave you off with some reading material that I think is really important to kind of like broaden your horizons on what design is. Um, so, what is good design? Um, one of my favorite people to follow is Dieter Rams. He has 10 principles of good design. Uh, the first one is that it's innovative. So that means that you're kind of breaking new ground. Um, in our industry, we work with a lot of new technology and we have to kind of adapt with the times. So it's really important to be able to recognize that and to kind of like follow suit with what everybody else is doing um, in and around you, in a, your industry and around your products that you're trying to sell. Um, another part is that good design makes a product useful. So this is like super important for what I do for a living. Um, if, if the product you're trying to sell doesn't really work very well, then no, amount, no amount of design is going to make that any better. However, if your product does work really well and your, your users and your people that are buying it are like really into it, then design can only help. Another part of it, obviously, is aesthetic. Uh, not just making it pretty, but making it attractive. So a lot of people will you know, pass through Target and they'll see like a product on the shelves and they're like, oh, I think that's really cool. Um, if it's designed well, people will be attracted to it and they'll potentially buy it more often than not. Uh, it makes a product understandable. So this is just like getting the message across, which is one of the most important things your design can do, which is pretty much the fundamental reason why people do design um, and, and graphic design. Just creating that message and like communicating it well so that people will understand it across the board. 
Uh, it's unobtrusive, so that means it's uh, not really a decorative object. You know, kind of like designing to be a minimalist, and um, also again, harkening back to like getting that message across quickly and efficiently. So, one of my favorite quotes from one of my friends uh, that worked alongside me in Omaha uh, is, good design is obvious and great design is transparent, which basically means that good design is something that you can see and people will recognize. And they'll be like, oh yeah, that's designed well. Um, but great design is something that a lot of people don't really necessarily see, but they interact with on a daily. Um, maybe it's something that they just like use, whether it's like WordPress, um, an efficient plugin theme. But they just love that they don't really necessarily think of it as good design, it's like, but it's designed well, and then they use it. Uh, work with Dieter Rams. The good design is honest, and I don't know if I'm here saying that it's true. My last name is true, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> uh, this is what my coworkers deal with every day. So, um, so basically the product you're selling needs to be able to stand on its own as something good. Uh, again, good design won't make it any better, but uh, you won't be pulling wool over anyone's eyes if your product isn't as uh, efficient and as as like suitable as what they need. Um, it's long lasting. So basically, today's society is a throwaway society. We don't tend to hold on to a lot of things. We like get them in the mail, and we're like, okay, well that's cool. I'm gonna throw it away. So when it comes to like maybe print collateral, if you design something that's to be printed on something that's like a thicker paper, a little bit more unique texture, people tend to hold on to that a little longer. Granted, they'll probably end up throwing it away at some point. Um, but I found that if you try to like pay attention to the details a little bit closer, then people generally will think of it as art more than design and maybe hold on to it a little longer. So. Uh, Good design is also thorough, so that means just paying attention to the details, making sure that you cover all your bases. Um, so like, a company that I love that does this is obviously Apple, um, with their package design. So like, it's an experience in and of itself when you're opening up every box and you're trying to get to your new computer or something. Um, and they just, they really pay attention to how even things are unwrapped. I just love that. Uh, good design is environmentally friendly, so that doesn't mean just making things biodegradable, but it also means that it's not going to distract from what's surrounding it. So like you make a billboard, um, try to see if it'll like in interact with its environment a little bit better uh, so that it's not as distracting to maybe like, if you have like a historic monument nearby, it's not like gonna be obnoxious. Uh, and also, and lastly, uh, good design is as little design as possible. So. Being a minimalist at heart, I just think that you don't want to have as many flourishes as what we used to do, or using flash, or things that just kind of get in the way of like uh, communicating that message that your design is trying to give to their users. And uh, it's just it's better to just try to strip away as much of the junk as possible. Which is just like a recap of what all those. Something else I want to talk about is the process of design. So obviously there's a lot of process, process that goes into it. Um, you need to like have a couple of starting points. So this is my desk again. Um, basically, it's usually a mess. <laughs> at any given point, if you come by my desk, I have like all sorts of projects going on at once. And um, it's good to just reset every now and then and just clean that up. Um, you achieve your goals a little bit better when you like have a process. If you do a little bit every day, like if you have like a goal that you set for, like if you have this major design project that you're trying to accomplish, and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to even get that started. It's good to just like hack away at that, like 15 minutes every day, um, and eventually you'll hit that goal. Communication is super important. So um, for those of you, this is who don't know what it is, Slack. Um, this is major form of communication at Flywheel. Um, we like to use this because it's a little bit quicker, it's a little bit, uh, you know, unintrusive. It's just like a nice way to like say, hey, did you get this project done? Did you, did you see this cool article? Um, so part of my process involves just like communicating with my coworkers and sometimes clients via Slack or email. 
so step one in my process is three steps. Uh, step one, discovery. Oops, discovery. <laughs> um, so basically this should cover about one third to one half of your actual process. So it's super important that you do this right. Um, if you're trying to gather a bunch of research about your client, what their demographic is of their own clients that they're, they're trying to target, that's super important so that you know what your designs need to look like and how they should be interacted with um, when you do end up going into production. So when this comes up for like designing uh, like a website, you need to like figure out like do they need like a home page? Do they do they need that carousel? Or do they need to have like a bunch of um, content management? Or is it an e-commerce site? Uh, figuring all of that in the very beginning definitely like impact what happens later on in the process. So basically, just getting like a timeline, the style, the budget, everything down. Uh, step two is the actual design. So this encompasses all the sketching, the wireframing. I like to use Google Docs just because it's a little bit easier to share with my coworkers and if they want to do edits, they can. Um, getting every idea out there, whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter, just so it gets out of your head. Um, I find that just sketching it down like super quick just to see if it even works is the best way. Uh, and then once you do that, just narrow the designs down, like two to three at least and then present them to your client or, in my case, my boss. <laughs> uh, the third step is delivery. So sometimes this actually results back to step two in like redesigning because sometimes your client won't like what you've done and they'll say, hey, you know, like, I actually would prefer this wireframe to look like that or, or this logo to be slightly different. So you go back and you redesign and this can happen two or three times. In my case, I've had that happen several times with a few clients, so it's kind of interesting. Depends on like who you're working with. Um, and then once you're done with that, hopefully they approve, and then you can move forward with printing it, coding it, and then producing it, and hopefully a little bit of testing it to have to see like WordPress or something like that. So basically, I like to call this the design rinse and repeat method. <laughs> so when you're going through that process, I design and repeat a lot. Um, and then I have this really cool Venn diagram that kind of gives you an example of like what these three steps look like interacting with one another. So the discovery section definitely like influences design, like whether or not it's like where is it used, how is it going to be used, the design is influenced by that. Um, the user experience uh, with the delivery, whether or not like, your developer needs to know like, okay, who am I like coding this for? That's super important. Um, and design influences use and user interface and so on. So when you get all those together, it usually works out. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just this is another part of my desk. I don't know why I have so many photos of my desk. But um, more puns, true do's. Um, keeping a list of to-dos, or in my case, true-dos, <laughs> is, is a good way to stay organized, and it's nearly impossible to miss those important steps along the way, and also if you just like any and everything, you know, if you have like an idea that's so far-fetched, just keep it in a, you know, in your notebook or something, and maybe someday you can come back to it. Um, so this is like a super, this is something that I like to think about whenever I'm designing and I usually like throw this in there somewhere during my process. It's like, it's not about what it really looks like, it's like how it makes someone feel. Like, does it make them feel happy? So like with Flywheel, we try to be a little bit more whimsical and fun. Is this gonna make people feel that? Uh, so basically, just try to like, think about how people are going to interact with your product or your design and whether or not it influences their emotions. Another tip that I have um, with process is just to maintain momentum through frequency. Um, there's been a couple of studies done that the human brain doesn't really operate on <laughs> interval, like operates on intervals of like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and 90 minutes. So if you're able to like kind of group in your daily tasks, whether it be design or otherwise, into these increments, then more likely 
you're going to get your work done. And then uh, at the end of the day, hopefully you have a great design after all the RBF that you have. <laughs> like, um, so I wanted to kind of dive in a little bit into a potential idea that we're thinking about at Flywheel. It's just kind of like a refresh. We wanted to give us a little bit of an opportunity ourselves to take all of this and kind of create like a better, a better design for ourselves. So how many of you are designers here? Okay, well, all right, that's a lot of you. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have gone through like a rebranding process of sorts or maybe like even refreshing, elevating a brand. Um, designing for yourself is actually one of the most difficult things that I've ever experienced because you have to make all the decisions yourself. You don't have a lot of barriers, which is really nice to have when working with clients because they say, hey, I like the color blue or hey, I love hearts and have that in the logo somewhere. Um, so when designing for yourself, you go through a lot of rounds of revisions and a lot of iterations and it can be kind of tiresome but also very rewarding in the end when you actually do come up with a solution. Um, we're just kind of thinking, maybe simplifying, just kind of moving forward, uh, not altering our logo too much, mostly because our CTO, Tony, has it tattooed on his forearm. So, <laughs> I was joking with him, actually, when I first started working at Flywheel, that I would design it as a square, and he would just have to fill in his tattoo. So, it all works out. <laughs> um, this is part of just like a, like a refresh process that I'm just showing you. So, um, we have a unit of measurement we call just EFIT, which is taken from our F in flywheel. And I use this as a way to indicate a clear zone so that people, when they're taking like potential brand guide in the future that we're hoping to create soon, um, that they can use this as a guideline so that they can't get graphics too close to our logo, which would impair readability. And uh, you don't want things getting that close. So clear zones are important. Also, sizing is also very important with logos. So this like just basically shows you how small our logo can get and what it looks like when it gets almost to a bug size, which is simplification of the actual logo itself. So if you make it super tiny, maybe you just strip away some of the things that aren't necessary that do happen to get lost when you're shrinking it down. So another part of the process is understanding how a logo is used. And there are so many, so many ways that you can show a logo not to be used. But there, in my experience, if I, if I'd given a piece of art to someone who was not the one that had worked on it initially, they potentially have a way to fuck it up. <laughs> and so uh, it's good to just give them like a guideline of like how not to use it, which could be two or three pages, to be honest. Uh, so again, with flywheel. Color. We're thinking, you know, we want just we don't want to just be like stuck in a color box. We want to like unleash our rainbow. <laughs> so we're kind of expanding and thinking, okay, let's go ahead and try adding some new colors for our palette, little bright and fun colors to kind of exemplify what we do as a company, which is provide a little bit of joy. Um, so this is just a breakdown of those colors. So this gets a little bit more granular and just something that you can kind of visualize living in a brand guide so that again, some people, when they take it and they're not necessarily the person that came up with this, then they're able to understand and get in your head a little easier and just replicate what you've already put in place. So, same thing with fonts, keeping it simple. We just have a primary and a secondary font that we use most of the time. Uh, but we've also been like playing around with the idea of using some fancy fonts, just some things that are a little bit more human touch. Um, and again, this is just like specific to Flywheel. Uh, a lot of brands probably wouldn't want this if you were more of a corporate brand. You probably want to stay away from things like this. But with Flywheel, we're more about like human engagement, and so we wanted to show that through fonts. <coughs> so another thing, I love this. It's called so kerning is caring. Because again, going back details. Um, when I worked at a couple of ad agencies, that was one of the main things that they really like hit home was like, is that is that oh like too like too much space on each side of that oh you have to like tighten it up. So uh, just paying attention to the details again. Um, again with Flywheel's brand, just like it's more than just making it pretty. We wanted to make our visuals just have like cohesion 
So a lot of you use iconography in your, in your artwork, I'm sure. Um, we wanted to make sure that ours has a little bit more purpose and like what it can look like when we move it into illustrations, a little bit larger, things that we've been using uh, just in like promotional materials mostly and on our website. So like even what headshots look like, like white backgrounds, beautiful headshots. <laughs> My friend Jamie in the middle there. And I use her as an example a lot. Um, what do you, uh, lifestyle photography and videos look like? So this would all live in like a brand guide. So it just gives people an idea. Um, promotional materials using those fun colors. And what does the whimsy that we try to uh, show visually, what does that look like? Uh, a couple of things that we rolled out recently is uh, a new sign up page. So we have these really cool animations that we've incorporated into that uh, just to show a more fun visual to the usual boring stuff. <laughs> so, hopefully out. Some of our clients really like it. So it's really cool to like see how people interact and notice these little details that we don't necessarily promote or advertise. <laughs> Um, so other than, you know, just that, like some design work that I've done with Flywheel, uh, one of my first things was Camp Flywheel, so we did this internship program which was really cool uh, and sort of based it off of Moonrise Kingdom, <laughs> so Camp Flywheel, Moonrise Kingdom, you can kind of see a connection there. Uh, personally, I think that Wes Anderson is a very whimsical style like to his movies, so I wanted to kind of play a little bit with that and basically come up with this can't fly wheel approach. So all of this is original photography and also just going that extra mile just trying to like make things as original as possible using my friend that I work with her hand <laughs> to hold this cute little Volkswagen miniature and then just the entire site. So this is a micro site for potential intern hires to go to and just kind of get an idea of what our brand was like um, scrolling down, there's a lot of things here that could be viewed as not necessary, but when it comes to flywheel, it's a little bit more about, you know, that whimsical approach, that fun, trying to show, like, our culture a little bit through fun little ways. So, we got some parallax effects going on. We show uh, part of our office space so people can get an idea of that approach. We like to give away free food all the time at work. So just keeping in line with the whole Wes Anderson approach and some of the people that are what we're looking for and what they look like. Um, so behind the scenes, what that was like is just basically like taking the photography. Um, it's really cool if you any ad agency that I've worked with, I've always tried to get them to have a photography room because I think it's super important to have that original photography used within your own artwork. Um, you can go to stock, you know, stock sites and get stock photos. I think that's fine, but um, it, it really sends a message to your clients when you show them that you care just as much about your design as you do about theirs. So, again, this is designing for yourself. Um, a little bit of process work with some promotional advertising. We posted these up at colleges and around town trying to get people who are possibly interested in an internship at Flywheel to apply. A little call to action at the bottom. Um, again, driving that message. Same theme throughout all of that. Um, this is just like a little snapshot of how the website actually, how well it did. Um, so we launched in February, and from February to April, we had about 13,000 page views, which is pretty good for a company our size. Uh, and most people, when they visited our site, they stayed on there for about three minutes, which I think is pretty big too. Like, I know it's like an average uh, user to be on site is like 30 seconds about, so for three minutes, that's nice. Um, so with the internship campaign, we decided to blow it out even more, and when the interns actually came, we gave them this cool little gift set. So basically creating a physical piece of the Wes Anderson approach. So at the office, we have um, Nerf guns, so I wanted to give them something that they can also shoot back with. That's what that was for. With the, yeah. um, this notebook, we usually hand out notebooks to every employee anyway, so I just have this one that's a little bit more camp-like with this so That was the internship campaign. Um, 
Another thing that we've been doing is these skylines, which I think have been almost like a happy accident. We started them just like as just something that we needed for our own city in Omaha, and then kind of blew it out to every city that we visit. So um, since doing them, we've been to all these cities and Boston. So basically what these guidelines are used for is for our promotional materials to advertise that we're coming to these work camps. And uh, just kind of like keeping that theme in place. So basically, this just like shows like a super hyperlapse of like how I create those guidelines, which just gives you an idea behind like maybe going to Google and just finding an image and making sure that those buildings are actually there. <laughs> and, uh, just tracing over them, scaling them, and moving forward. So I've already kind of built a little bit of uh, a library of these icons that I use in each skyline. Just to make the process a little bit faster. At first, it was kind of slow, uh, just trying to create buildings and just trying to get the scale proportional with all the other buildings that were in each city. Uh, so some cities will have like these cool pedestrian bridges. So doing that. I always enjoy hyperlapse because it just like gives you like a really quick like overview of like the actual process. So to tie it back to why design matters, this like shows you there's a lot more behind like oh that's that icon looked like it was really easy to make. Well, this actually takes like two hours. So um, just showing you the in-depth detail that it actually does take. So I can skip ahead a little. Um, Basically, we use that skyline for like uh, Facebook advertisements, things just like show our community or our clients that we're coming here, maybe say hi. Um, one other thing that you may have noticed that's really cool is we're, we've been tapping into Snapchat a little bit, uh, which is personally one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I like Snapchat, I think it's really cool. Um, basically, we've been making the skylines for each community that we visit and using it during the event, and then after the fact, we submit um, a community filter. So it's similar, but it doesn't have any branding on it at all. And so we have Ottawa, Ontario up there. So Snapchat actually saw that, loved it, put it in um, this carousel up at the top of their geo filter page, which was really neat, um, which actually was kind of like a catalyst to all of our little Snapchat endeavors. So from now on, you'll be seeing these at every WordCamp, hopefully uh, we'll be able to do that. So this is where, okay, the process. So like I said before, it's really important to adhere to it. Otherwise, if it's ignored, bad things can happen. Um, a lot of people think that like with design, it's not, not too important if people don't notice it. Um, and then when they do notice it, it can either be very good or it could be very bad. Um, so one of my examples that I actually had the privilege to work on um, was Nebraska license plates. However, my designs did not get chosen. Um, and this is our mayor picking the final design, which I found out later was mostly like designed by committee, which those of you who are designers know that that can be the death of every good project. Uh, so you can see why this would be wrong and why Nebraskans had a really bad reaction to it. Uh, so you're having the same reaction that most of us have. Was, was laughing. We were, we were happy. Like, well, we weren't happy. We were laughing. We were like making a mockery of it. And then, then we were furious because then we realized that this is the general issued license plates, which means this is the free one that would go on all of our cars. Otherwise, we'd have to pay for a vanity plate. Um, so one thing to know as a designer, and I'm sure most of you probably would agree, that uh, when I design anything, generally you're so close to it that you don't recognize that there's something horribly wrong with it. <laughs> so I like to call that finding the penis. <laughs> so, not everyone will like your design. And this is just a fact of life. So not everyone will like you, nobody, you know, you don't, it's fine, you just move forward, you pay your dues. 
Um, but in this case, it was worse. <laughs> so we, we got made fun of on a national level. Um, and that was cool. So we got some recognition. And that's awesome. Nebraska. Um, Slack chat, or Slack channel, whatever you want to call it. Um, people, people reacted pretty negatively to it, making their own memes and things. Pretty funny. Um, then it kept getting some news. This was uh, on SNL, I, I believe, where they just they briefly mentioned it. But it was to point out that because of this overwhelming response, um, what they had already picked to be the license plate became a costly disaster for that that team that had actually chosen it. So they actually pulled the license plates mid press and. Uh, had to throw out those ones and basically start over. Um, so basically here, if you fail, it's okay to ask for forgiveness, even though it's pretty obvious that this one was bad. Um, the, this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of what they were trying to do. So the license plate that they had was trying to use what our state capitol building has on top of it, which is a sewer. So if you can see the one on the left, the, the green one. The, the hand is turned down, a little less phallic. <laughs> the one on the right is actually from Michigan State University, so it's not even from Nebraska. Uh, and it was taken, it, it was actually taken from a contest that was done in 2002 to create a license plate back then. It wasn't chosen, so they dug it back up and they didn't contact the artist. The artist actually found out about it and they're like, I'm so sorry that nobody liked my design. It's not my fault, I didn't know that they would choose it for this round. So, basically what ended up happening, they pulled the plates mid-press and redesigned it to a little bit better. So that was great, but it's better. So this is what we're going with. Um, what this actually triggered was a little bit of an outcry in the design community in Omaha, um, specifically. And a couple of designers, they just like went through the process trying to figure out a way to like pitch new designs. So these actually ended up being some vanity plates, which are pretty nice. So in my opinion, better, I would probably pay for that. Um, this one I think is still kind of going through as an option. So just a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit simpler. Um, so in this case, less but better. Uh, so yeah, those are my examples of good and bad design. <laughs> and I hope that you can see the contrast between like why it's important to invest in design. Because then, you know, you can either end up with something really good or something really bad. And so yeah, these, if you guys want to take a picture, it's basically like my list of books that I absolutely love that have taught me so much as being a designer and basically how to manage my day-to-day. -day. The top book is actually super great, um, called Manage Your Day-to-Day. -day. It has a lot of really cool creative quotes in there from people that have cool, cool processes and how they, like, don't check their email at the beginning of the day. They like do their most important task at the very beginning. They don't try to do inbox zero. Um, things like that. So yeah, those are my good design matters. Trump and Pence logo that they're mentioning, so if anybody saw that, 
Yeah, and and honestly, like that one, that's like such a large scale. Like people really should like pay attention to what they're doing, especially look for the penis in that one. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't put that on my slide. But any other questions? Where you either know what you're doing or you have no clue. <laughs> like, I was like that until I started working at Flywheel, really. I didn't really use it that often. Um, so, with the Snapchat filters, if you just like swipe after you take the photo, it's right there. Uh, there's a few, I think, other like city filters, I think, that are in there. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. It's just like another way to extend your branding. It's probably like a really nice untapped market that you can use for free advertising or almost free advertising in some cases. So. Yeah, we're trying to see how like Snapchat will monetize their, their whole like business with that. So. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I just see that slide with books one more time. Yeah. <laughs> That's me holding some books. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I definitely recommend these reads. Like. Uh, they just they have a, a broader spectrum of like what design is and how people's creative processes play a role and how they've been successful. So is this presentation online? Um, I don't have it online right now, but I might I, I was thinking about putting it online and like just feeding it out. So at the bottom I have my Twitter handle, so if you want to look for that, I just set that up. Thank you. All right. Thanks guys.